Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for coming along. My name is Dr. Leslie Maben, and I am a lecturer in environmental systems in the, the School of Engineering and Innovation at the, the Open University. And I'm very glad to have the, the chance today to, to do the Ask the Experts. Um, but I'll be talking about uh, how, how Japan is responding to climate change and why this, this matters for the UK. And what I'm mainly going to be speaking about are some, some very new research results from a, a project that's just been concluded along with colleagues from uh, Kyushu University and, and Kyoto University and, uh, and funded by the, the British Academy. So we're, we're very grateful indeed to the, the British Academy for their, their support for this work. And I'm going to be sharing with you some of the, the, the results from that project as, as well as a, a, a wider sense of what's going on in Japan with climate change and, and why this uh, this really matters for the, for the UK. Um, so how it's going to work is I will talk for about half an hour or thereabouts, and I'm very happy to take questions thereafter. Um, got a whole different team of colleagues behind the scenes who are going to maybe relay the questions to me in the chat box. So I'll, I'll keep an eye on that and I'll, I'll try and sort of answer things as, as we go along the way as well as, as best I can. So um, let's just say something very briefly about Japan and, and climate change. And Japan, as is, you, you may know, is a uh, very it's a very high emitting nation. You know, it's, it's one of the, the G7, a, a highly developed and affluent country that emits a lot of carbon dioxide and is a you know, is a significant contributor to uh, to climate change globally. Um, and it's especially so from uh, from energy, um, electricity, but also energy used for various industries in Japan, like making steel, paper, things like that. So energy, particularly, is, is a big issue for um, contributing to, to Japan's emissions and thus its, uh, its role in, in climate change. Um, as a country, uh, Japan relies quite heavily on um, fossil fuel power sources for, uh, for its, its electricity, indeed for its energy, coal, gas especially. Although, and I'll say a little more about this later, renewable sources, so offshore wind, solar are, you know, are increasing and you know, there are ambitious plans to, to scale these, these up. Um, the other side of this coin as well, though, is that Japan as a country is not immune from some of the hazards and threats that, that, that come around from, from climate change. The risks that climate change poses to Japan are also intensifying. So you have um, storms, rainfall, changing weather patterns. So in the uh, in the last week, actually, we've had crippling heat waves in Japan, you know, up, up to 40 degrees in the Tokyo area. And there have also been very you know heavy rainfall you know some of the hot places just north of tokyo that had heat waves last week and are now being evacuated for flooding this week so in you know, japan is also seeing the, the, these weather extremes as well um which is you know is the other side of the same coin so you know climate change is both something that japan is a significant contributor to but also is um you know, notably and increasingly affected by it's maybe a bit different What's a bit unique about Japan? What what makes Japan, I guess, interesting? You know, why why does this matter for, for us in the UK? And I suppose in some ways, Japan is as an extreme case of, of of a lot of the challenges that, that wealthy nations face when it comes to responding to climate change. But also, it's a you know an extreme example of maybe some of the issues that the the UK has uh, coming down the line in terms of population change and demographic and economic change. So. Especially after we had the COP26, we had the climate change conference in, in Glasgow at the end of last year. And the Japanese government faced a, you know, a lot of criticism, um, and they still do within, within the, the, the group of economically most wealthy nations, for comparatively slow progress on moving electricity away from coal and gas and towards renewable power to, to reducing emissions and things like that and for a, a continued reliance on, um, on fossil fuel power. This was actually very well demonstrated when we had the, the start of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and a lot of, of um, nations in, in Europe moved quite quickly, um, or maybe not quickly enough, to, you know, to, to look at pulling out of uh, projects in, in Russia and joint projects with Russia, whereas the Japanese government was, was criticised for not pulling out of some of the joint gas projects 
the, the argument being that, that Japan has, you know, energy security issues and they need access to, you know, to, to this gas, particularly for power and for dealing with, you know, what you need during heat waves to, to keep cooling systems running. So, you know, Japan is, to be fair, you know, is in a challenging situation in terms of, of resource security, but has also faced a lot of criticism for, for you know, a, a slow response to, to climate challenges. Having said that, though, there is a lot of history in, in Japan that I think sometimes maybe doesn't get the, the attention it should about how energy, environment and society interact. And we can we can learn a lot from that. Now, you know, one of the most obvious one, the, the most kind of recent aspect of this is the, the Fukushima nuclear accident in 2011, where... Um, you know, we had an earthquake and tsunami, it caused a very large nuclear meltdown, and this kind of brought to the forefront questions of the places in Japan that have to host a lot of this energy infrastructure, this risky and undesirable infrastructure, and, you know, are also the places that maybe don't necessarily use that electricity. So the electricity from Fukushima got sent off to, to Tokyo, whereas, you know, the residents nearby, you know, arguably had to bear a disproportionate burden of the, the risks that came within that. There's also, and I'll say a bit more about this as I get through my slides, there's a lot more about um, coal mining closures historically in, in Japan, coal mining areas where mines have closed and local governments, municipalities have suffered you know, financial pressures and then population decline and things like that. So, you know, there's this history of thinking about how energy, climate, environment and then fairness come together. But, you know, looking forward as well, the Japanese government has got very ambitious plans for um, offshore wind, for using hydrogen in its, uh, it, it, its um, climate change responses. And, you know, and it's interesting to see how Japan is planning to put that into, into practice, given that in, in the UK too, you know, we, we're also developing offshore wind energy. We're also looking at hydrogen. So there's a lot of potential there for, for, for mutual learning. Well, for, for, for the purposes of today, I mean, I could talk all day about different aspects of energy in Japan, um, but I want to focus on one thing in particular, and that is particularly what happens to the places and the people whose jobs, and whose livelihoods, you know, have, have thus far relied quite a lot on industries that are, you know, maybe emit a lot of carbon dioxide, aren't necessarily compatible with, uh, you know, with, with our climate obligations and goals. And I want to talk particularly about um, what some thought this idea of a, a just transition means in the Japanese context. So this is a, this is a bit of a buzzword that um, gets used a lot in climate change policy and in, in research. It's a bit of a buzzword and it's kind of grown arms and legs. Um, but essentially this idea of a just transition is this idea of that we respond to climate change and sustainability challenges in a way that doesn't, you know, create new inequalities or doesn't intensify existing ones. Particularly, you know, paying attention to well, what happens to people and places, you know, whose jobs, whose local economies rely quite a lot on industries that you know that emit a lot of carbon dioxide, that rely on oil and gas, steelworks, paper making, and all these things. You know, I. I used to live in, in Aberdeen, up in the northeast of Scotland, and that's an area where you know, people have got very legitimate concerns about what a response to climate change and, and renewing our energy systems means means for their, their jobs. So we were especially interested, and we've been very interested in this the, the work we've been doing to understand well what does this idea of a just transition mean in Japan? You know, what does it look like in this Japanese context where you've got these resource pressures, where you've got this history of, of unfairness and inequality in, in, in energy systems and resource systems? What does this just transition look like in Japan? And what, again, might we in the UK learn from that? So, yeah, in, in Japan, um, a lot of the kind of environmental organizations and some of the political parties, you know, are starting to get a bit more interested in what this question of well, what does a climate change response mean for workers and for industrial regions? You know, these questions are are starting to, to come up. Um, and I think one thing that, that's important to, to kind of highlight is that Japan doesn't really have 
a lot of workers who are doing, you know, kind of extraction of fossil fuels. You know, that we maybe think about places like the North Sea, or we maybe think about uh, the Hunter Valley in Australia, or the, the, the tar sands in Canada. Japan doesn't have that kind of big extractive sector um, where a lot of scholars and, and policy people have looked at the just transition. So it's, it's maybe a little bit different in that sense. But what Japan does have is a lot of people that work in coal-fired power stations, a lot of people that work in nuclear power stations, and that's you know a bit of a, a contentious area when we think about climate change response. A lot of people that work in steel, petrochemicals, and the automotive sectors. And also, in, you know, something as somebody who trained as a trained as a geographer, something I'm really interested in is how do these what we'd call carbon intensive activities basically these things that contribute to climate change how do these link not just to jobs not just to money but how do they link to people's sense of their places that they live in and how do they link to people's sense of uh, of who they are and what i want you to bear in mind as I'm, I'm talking about some of our results is that when we talk about a just transition we're not just talking about jobs and money and the economy. We're talking about transitioning the lived environment, the built environment, people's sense of local identity, because you know, high emitting industries, carbon intensive industries, you know, really shape people's sense of who they are and they shape the, the environments that we live in. And so just to give you an example of this, um, this is a city of Tomakomai which is, um, is up in the, the, the north of Japan. It's somewhere that I've, I've done a lot of research and I've been there many times before the pandemic and I'm looking forward to being able to go back again soon. And so Tomokomai is a little um, port town in the, the south of Japan's northernmost island. Um, and you can maybe see in the middle of this picture, we've got a big chimney. There's a huge chimney there. And that's a paper mill. It's a, a paper mill which belongs to the, the OG Paper Company. And so what Tomokoma is, and people keep telling me, is it's not a, it's not a city with a paper mill. Tomokoma is a paper mill with a city built around it. So, you know, the whole city has been planned out and built and spread out around this, this paper factory. The whole way in which the built environment is set out. They've got hospitals called OG Hospital, which are named after the paper company. The, the roads, everything, the, the actual fabric of the built environment is built around this high emitting industry. You know, and it goes deep into people's sense of who they are too. So you've got, and I'm um, representing today the, the ice hockey team. I don't know if you can see, I've got my, my OG Eagles t-shirt. So this is the, the, the local ice hockey team in Tomokomai again, which were formed as part of the, uh, the paper company, the, the paper maker, you know, that was the works team. Sport, all these things. You know, when we talk about high emitting industries, you know, these really shape the lived environment, they shape people's sense of who they are. And so when we talk about shutting down changing industries, at a local level, it's not just changing jobs and economy. It's actually, you're changing things that are deeply rooted in people's sense of, of identity and, and pride and purpose. And that's why getting these transitions right is so important. And that's, you know, that's what we're really interested in doing with, with this work around Japan. Well, what does this mean? What does a just transition mean at a local level for jobs, economy, and identity? Well, let's, you know, let, let's dig down a little bit into the, into the data. And I do apologize for a slightly uh, scary graph here. Because one of the things that we did with this project was to actually just try and understand some of the, 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 the geography, if you like, and try and understand, well, where actually are these workers? You know, which, which parts of Japan have the most workers in industries that maybe are going to be impacted by Japan's climate change obligations? Um, so in terms of sheer numbers, you know, it's, it's around the big cities, as you might expect, or in Tokyo, um, Osaka, Kobe. These areas are, are where a lot of the workers are, are, are located. But in terms of kind of the proportion, the share of the workforce, um, it tends to be the kind of more rural peripheral areas, um, and I'll show you on a map in a second where these are, around up in the, the north of the country, the kind of more rural areas up in the, in the north and down in the south. These tend to be the areas that have a higher proportion of people who work in 
coal-fired power stations, in steelworks, petrochemical refineries. So you know this is you know the, there are places that have got, you know got a disproportionately large you know share of these these industries and thus who might be disproportionately affected by how Japan chooses to respond to climate change. And we pulled out a map, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this this map on the right that we have here, because what this shows us this shows us that the actual cities and um, the richest cities in Japan. And the places in the top 50 of Japan's richest local governments that get most of their revenue from energy, particularly from coal and oil and gas, from refining, from nuclear power stations. And these, you know, these are not big places. You know, these are quite small places. These are small local governments that get a lot of money from the kind of tax payments, the payments, the revenues that come from having big coal-fired power stations, gas power stations, nuclear power stations in their um, in their locality, you know, these, these kind of payments that they get for having those. And what, what I'm kind of driving at here is that the places that rely on the high emitting sectors, the energy sector for jobs and income, these are often more rural places where there may be aren't so many other opportunities for, uh, for employment. There may, aren't really so many opportunities to diversify the economy. And where you've got all these other issues that Japan's facing, you've got aging population, you've got a declining population, a declining tax base, a declining workforce. So what does it mean to you know, move away from, from high emitting industries? What does it mean for these places where you've, you know, that rely quite a lot on this money, but don't necessarily have a lot of other options, and also, you know, have a, an ever smaller kind of tax revenue to, to think about what they're going to do next. And it's worth thinking too that a lot of these places, especially up in the in the north, in the city on the map, Niigata, or Fukushima, these places tend to produce energy for the big urbanized areas in, in Tokyo and Osaka, that energy doesn't tend to be used locally. So potentially there's a, there's a fairness issue here as well. So again, we, we did some work to try and just look at where some of the, the, the jobs are, where might the, the opportunities be for, for green jobs in Japan, and how might that map up to where some of these threats are that I've just talked about. And what we find is that up in the again up in the north, so these these blue pink areas here like Hokuriku, Tohoku, Japan is really keen on putting offshore wind there. There's going to be a lot of big wind turbines going in the sea. These are also areas where you've got at the moment a lot of people who work in these these big high emitting sectors. So maybe there's potential there to think how might we link up the people? How might we retrain, for instance, the people? How might we reappropriate the infrastructure and the places that are doing oil and gas power at the moment? Could we then get these people working in offshore wind? That's something we might see. You've also got places down in the further south here. So we say here, Chugoku, Shikoku. Um, you've got then a lot of shipbuilding. You've also got a lot of refining, a lot of petrochemicals down there. If Japan's serious about having a hydrogen economy, for example, if they're serious about having, you know, transporting carbon dioxide to store it, you're going to need ships. Could you re get some of these shipyards, you know, geared up to do that, for example? You know, could you get some of the oil refineries, could you repurpose them so that they are making clean types of hydrogen? You know, so this is what we've been doing is to try and see, are there places where you might map up risks, you know, and opportunities? Could you use some of that infrastructure and local identity and pride as a, a sort of force for good, you know, to, to, to do better things that will help Japan meet its climate goals? You know, it's difficult to estimate that. So this is what we've been doing, is looking at some of these relative differences. Are there places where opportunities map up to challenges? Can we find places that have similar characteristics, both within Japan and, and internationally? I did want to very briefly to kind of give you a bigger sort of level overview as well, because my, my colleagues in, from, from Kyushu University and Kyoto University did a, a couple of surveys around um, around uh, around this idea of a just transition. Um, 
So my colleague, I'm Dr. Andrew Chapman and his team at Kyushu University, they asked the public in Japan what the public thought about um, you know, an energy transition and who they thought should be responsible. Did to pick out a couple of things from these, these graphs, I'm, I'm going to bombard people with graphs, but to pick out a couple of things from here, one thing to note is that, that a lot of the Japanese public thought, well, who should pay for a just transition? It should be, you know, recovered from tax and industry should pay. You know, what, you know who's, you know, who, um, who should be, you know, who might be the, the kind of people who maybe lose out from that? People said, well, maybe domestic industry, domestic nuclear industry, who are the people that, that maybe matter most? Can we do in response in the bottom right here, a lot of enthusiasm for solar and for wind power. And on the bottom left there again, a lot of enthusiasm for, for solar. But the thing that we maybe find a bit worrying about this are the big bars at the bottom that say, have not considered, do nothing, not sure. So what the, the, my colleagues found was that, you know, there's a lot of people in the, in the Japanese public who uh, maybe haven't really thought a lot yet about what an energy transition means for different jobs, for different places, who haven't thought about what this might mean for the people in places that work in these, in these high emitting sectors. Good support for renewable energy, a lot of support from the public for, for some of these things, a lot of support for raising taxes and actually for, you know, getting industry to pay to make the transition happen. Not necessarily so much awareness among the wider public of what this transition actually means. One interesting thing that, that, that Andrew and his team did find was that places where the understanding and awareness was higher where Fukushima, where you had the nuclear accident, where people were maybe very acutely aware of what these questions of fairness might mean for, you know, for, for, for them. And also in, in the west of Japan, where there had just been, when we did the survey, there had just been a big G20 summit where they talked about energy and climate. So maybe because of that, people were a, were a bit more aware. My colleagues at Kyoto University and Ben McClellan and his group, they then actually looked in a bit more depth at hydrogen. And hydrogen is one of these things that we're starting to see a bit more of it coming into the discussions globally as a, another replacement fuel, as well as electricity and batteries. Um, but what we found with, with, with hydrogen was that, again, a lot of consumers aren't really very aware of it. You know, they're not really aware of what hydrogen means for Japan's climate change efforts. They don't know about how we make hydrogen. They don't know about what the Japanese government is, is planning. But people are worried about you know, the environmental costs and the, the actual the, the financial costs of, of what it might mean. So you know, again, both these, these sets of surveys, what they show is that at a national level, although you know, we've, we've seen that you know, doing this transition right is really important and that there are good opportunities for, for doing it right, that kind of understanding and knowledge isn't perhaps seeping out to the wider public in Japan. Interestingly as well, you know, we've just had an election in Japan. Um, just, you know, just last weekend, you know, there was an election and the, the current Prime Minister, Kishida, Fumio Kishida, he won, you know, he won, he was re-elected. Climate change, energy issues featured very low down in the, the kind of the things that the, 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 the different candidates were talking about. You know, weren't very high up the agenda, but you are, you know, are going to be critical issues going forward. So I want to come to finish, I want to come back to what I said right at the start. And, you know, and I said, you know, when we talk about transitions, we're not just talking about jobs in the economy, but we're talking about places. And I just want to give you a couple of in-depth examples of a, two different places in Japan that show us how and why doing this transition right really matters and what it might look like with, with Japanese characteristics. And so the first example is, is, is a place that often gets held up as a, a famous example of, of what can go wrong, but also what can go right when it comes to an, an energy um, and an environmental transition. This is the, the former coal mining city of, of Yubari up in, the, up in the, the far north, again, up in, the, in Hokkaido. So, Yubari, and what you can see here is that an old coal mining, mine worker's house. And um, coal mining is an important part of Yubari's economy. So this is a, a low-res photo from the 1960s where the population of Yubari was up to about 120,000. 
produced a lot of Japan's coal, a couple of big coal mines. You know, there was a lot of, of money went into building infrastructure. The coal industry paid for hospitals, schools, government buildings to support what they did. That was all fine until not, not for climate change reasons, but just because of economics and technological progress. Coal became not so important to Japan anymore. And, you know, we have had a familiar story that we see in the UK as well with places like Ayrshire and uh, Fife and uh, you know, bits of Yorkshire as well, where mines closed in the early 1990s, new jobs didn't come in to replace them, tax revenue didn't come in. And the result of this was that the city actually went bankrupt. Ubari went bankrupt in 2007 because no workers, no revenue, no money coming in. The population now, bear in mind, I said it was almost 120,000. It's now below 8,000. So that's a huge shrinkage of the population, a huge um, decline in, in the population. And about half of those people you know, are over 60. And so what Ubari is now doing, what the government's now doing, is working to try and create a smaller city, a more compact city, actually you know, physically moving people to, to new houses in the middle and actually working with community groups to support things like, um, you know, um, education for, for young people, you know, environmental education, community events, um, extra welfare support for older people, these kind of things. And what they're doing now in Ubari is, you know, there's, there's a lot of collaboration between local organisations and the government to really kind of preserve and, and use as a force for good this, this coal mining heritage. And this is, you know, this is a, a sort of, fake Christmas tree that they built out of um, various bits that were lying around and it was a local non-governmental organisation that brought people together to, you know, to do this as a way to kind of get people to do mutual support and, and, and look out for each other yeah, in, in the absence of a, a large community. So this is just an illustration again of how these kind of identity that we have from the past and how these, these ideas of, um, of what comes next can, can come together. Another maybe slightly more recent example is somewhere a bit further south. And so this is the city of Iwaki in, in Fukushima. So when you think about Fukushima, unfortunately, we often think about nuclear accidents, but there's a lot of other things we can learn from, from Fukushima prefecture, from that region, about um, Japan's renewal of its energy systems. Um, so Iwaki today is a kind of big coastal a region a bit south of where the, the nuclear plant was. And in the, the 1960s, 1970s, Iwaki also had a big um, coal mining industry. And again, for, for reasons that weren't to do with climate, those coal mines closed down. But the difference is, compared to Ubari, the local government saw this coming. You know, they saw this was coming. They saw that, you know, hang on, we've got these mines that are closing. We've got a lot of workers here. We've got a potential problem. So they started early, they reorganised the, the local government, they merged areas so people could cooperate better. They talked to the unions, they talked to the local government, they talked to the industry, just found other jobs and think of new economic models. And the result of this was that about 95% of the coal workers found alternative jobs after the mines closed. You know, that's a, an early example, perhaps, of this, this idea of, of a just transition, that Here's a case where actually, you know, even though they might not have called it a just transition, you actually had new jobs and a new economic model for a region that relied quite a lot on, on coal mining. And that's why looking at history is important, because we can sometimes find actually, you know, people have been doing this stuff for, for quite a while. So that's one thing. Another interesting thing about Iwaki is if we, we fast forward to the present day, and again, I, I said at the start that Japan's got big and ambitious plans for offshore wind farms. And again, we see some parallels to what happened in, in Scotland and the UK. So a couple of years ago in, in, in Fukushima, they did a trial and a demonstration. They put a small offshore wind farm in the sea to see you know, just how different bits of technology would work. And let's not sugarcoat this, it didn't work very well. It didn't produce a lot of electricity. And all the kind of angry people on Twitter were like, ha-ha, we told you, see, we told you so offshore wind isn't going to work in Japan. Ha-ha, we need coal forever. But that's not quite the full story. Because although it was just a demonstration project, 
what this this offshore wind farm in, in, in Fukushima did was, you know, it got a lot of enthusiasm locally and a lot of industry, a lot of, of like manufacturers, local governments started to think, okay, well, maybe that demonstration didn't work, but there's something there we can work with. And what's happened as a result of that is that Iwaki City, this local government, has now set up a training scheme to certify workers so that they can get, you know, licensing and certification to be technicians for installing and maintaining offshore wind, you know, for, for installing and maintaining these turbines. So you're actually creating a pathway there where the skills of workers for renewable energy can be recognised. And you, you've got local companies like Aikawa is a really good example of us. They're a big a manufacturer in, in, in Iwaki. They've now shifted their whole business model to making wind turbines for, for the rest of Japan. So this is the kind of thing, again, you know, when we talk about using skills locally, using the infrastructure we have locally already, how can we repurpose you know, people's sense of pride? How can we reuse that for, as a force for good in a transition? And this is something that Iwaki is doing very well. So I'm just going to wrap up because I'm aware of what I said I would talk for half an hour and we're now at, uh, at about half an hour. So let's just say, well, what, what, does, what does Japan need? What do I think maybe Japan needs? for a fair response to climate change. And the first bit is it's about ensuring that some of the jobs and some of the revenues from new infrastructure go to nearby communities. So, you know, like I said at the start, historically places in Japan that have had to take power stations and, and things like that, oil refineries for the good of the whole country, haven't perhaps, you know, haven't always had benefits other than a big ton of cash, you know? so. There's a real need with things like offshore wind farms now to make sure that good, fair, meaningful jobs and infrastructure go to these places that need them most. There's also a need to support the local governments, and community organisations to make a transition happen in their locality. You know, like I said, the places like Yubari are a great example. You've got a loss of an industry, but at the same time, you've got a lot of a loss of income and a loss of workforce. Often these places, the local governments don't have a lot of money. They can't attract new staff. They can't train new staff. They're having to do very difficult jobs without necessarily having the human resources to do it. So there's a real need, I think, for the central government to reach out to these, these places and make sure that they have local governments in these, these places that are at risk, have got the skills and the workforce to, you know, to deal with some of these complex issues. And the last bit is remembering non-energy jobs. You know, a fair response to climate change isn't just about taking people from oil rigs and power stations and putting them onto wind farms. There's a lot of other things that need to be done too. You know, there's putting solar panels on buildings, you know, there's creating new energy efficient buildings, there's upgrading, there's a big, big construction job that needs to be done to make Japan's infrastructure climate resilient. All of these need to be part of the green jobs picture too. There's climate positive farming, there's you know, seaweed farming using nature. There's a whole suite of things that might support jobs and economies that aren't just making electricity. So just my last slide then, just to sum up. What, what, why does this matter? What, what, what can the UK learn? You know, we, we talk a lot about a just transition. The Scottish government has just put out a just transition report today, you know, another one. What can the UK learn from Japan's experience? I would say the first thing is, is language matters. So, I, you know, I've tried to be a bit careful today with the jargon, I've maybe not succeeded. You know, in research, in policy, we talk a lot about a just transition. If you try and talk to people we found in Japan about a just transition, they don't know what it means. But there's a lot of people doing good stuff that might fit with the, uh, this idea, even if they don't recognise it as such. So how do you talk to workers, trade unions, communities in a way that's not going to be disengaging or off-putting? You know, how do you understand these things without alienating people? The language we use matters. Just like I said before, th this issue of fairness matters. Japan shows that, Scotland shows that too, the UK shows that as well. Where are the places that are going to have to take up the infrastructure? How do we ensure that they get meaningful benefits on that? And we're not just asking them to take things up for, for the rest of the country. 
And lastly, you know, is, is this this thing about looking to history, you know? So Japan's got really good historic examples that show, you know, what can go wrong and what can go well as we change our energy systems and as we change our, our resource-based economies. Looking at history, looking at what's happened before, you know, show the importance of planning early and good coordination. And that's something I think we could learn from in the, in the UK as well. So if you're interested, here are the, the QR codes. These will take you to the reports that we produced from the project. They're also on my, my, my social media accounts, which are down at the bottom there. Very happy to take further questions by email as well. However, you know, I'm aware of talked a lot. So at this point, I will simply stop. I will thank you for your attention. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen and I would be very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Right, so um, I can see a questions coming in the, uh, in the chat on the, the bar here. Um, this is from, from Alex. Hi, Alex, thanks for the question. And Alex says, I would like to see a government taking net zero as a starting point for reformulation of policies across the board. In other words, we have to reach net zero. So uh, what follows from that? That's a really good question. That's a really, really good question. It's a, it's a really difficult question. Um, so I think what I would say in response to that, and we're maybe just starting to see it in Japan, is there's a realization now that reducing emissions, reducing reliance on high emitting energy sources. It's not just a climate issue. It's also a health issue. It's also a security issue. And it's also an issue about defending democracy. And let me just say a little bit about what I mean about each of these. Again, with maybe a bit of reference to the Japanese context. So you know, Japan's now got, um, you know, it's, Got really bad serious heat waves. And we know that when you have heat waves, you need air conditioning. You know, you need to cool down buildings or people, you know, harmful people who are vulnerable will, you know, will, will suffer. Part of that, Japan needs at the moment, because of the, the way their energy systems set up, they need coal, they need gas, you know, they need fossil fuels, which are very harmful to the climate. And um, the Japanese Prime Minister just announced just earlier today that he wants to restart nine nuclear power stations by the end of this year. So climate change is happening. And we're going to need energy to help us adapt to some of those responses. And we've got to make sure that that energy doesn't come from things that are going to make climate change worse. So we're going to have heat waves anyway. We're going to need to cool down our buildings. You know, we need to make sure that that energy doesn't come from things that are going to make climate change worse. So it's in our interest that we respond to the public health issues with energy that's clean. But otherwise, things are just going to get worse. Then defence and security as well. Like I said, Japan has relied quite a lot on liquefied natural gas that's come from Russia. That makes it very hard to, um, to say no to these places when they, you know, they commit acts of aggression against peaceful democracies like Ukraine. You know, and it also leaves us beholden to these. So Japan has territorial disputes with Russia as well. Again, you know, our reliance on fossil fuels, which often come from authoritarian states, can make it difficult to take a principled stand or even to take any kind of stand against these, you know, these authoritarian nations. So there's a real security case as well. There's a defense case for you know, renewing our energy systems and, and reducing our emissions. So it's a great question, Alex. And I suppose what I'm trying to say, and what I've spent far too long trying to answer, is that everything we do in all areas of public policy, health, defence, um, you know, infrastructure, transportation, the best way to do these things, the most effective way to do all these things, is actually to reduce our dependency on, on fossil fuels. So it's a great question. It's not an easy answer. Another question is just coming, I see, from, um, from Stephanie. And Stephanie says, do I think the UK will reach net zero by 2050? 
Um, that again is a, is a really challenging question. Um, the Climate Change Commission, the Triple C, there are sort of independent arms length body who are set up to review progress that the UK is making. They seem to think that we're we're struggling. The UK will struggle to reach net zero by 2050. Um, in Scotland, where I'm from, you know, we 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 tell a really positive story about being able to make a lot of electricity out of, out of wind farms. We're really good at that. We're really good at that. But there's a lot of other bits as well that are more challenging. And that's things like transportation. So how do we, you know, we can maybe make electricity from wind farms. How do we de decarbonize our transport system? Heating as well for homes. How do we get heat pumps rolled out? What do we do about buildings like mine that are, you know, old tenement buildings that aren't so easy to put some of these new technologies in? So I think it's going to be challenging to get to, to net zero by 2050. I think, you know, the, the actually the electricity generation maybe is a bit of low hanging fruit. We've got a lot of difficult things that come ahead around, um, around housing, around transportation. That's not to say we shouldn't try. It's going to be very challenging to reach net zero by 2050, but you know, I think it's absolutely imperative. And again, for the reasons I said in, in response to, uh, to Alex's questions, there's a real need, you know, that there's a lot of reasons why we should do this that go beyond um, just kind of reducing emissions. So do I think the UK will meet, reach net zero by 2050? I think we need a step change in the speed that we're doing things at. We need to listen to things that we need to hear, not things we want to hear but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. I can see another question here from, from Rachel. And Rachel says, do you think the culture of people in Japan lends itself more to them working for and changing behavior to make way for renewable energy than the culture of people in the UK? And that again, it's a, a really good question. It's a great question. Um, and I'm always, I always try and be a little bit careful when I answer questions like this, not to kind of make big generalizations about cultures, because you know Japan is also an increasingly diverse nation. You've got different levels of income. You've got you know different um, kind of migrant populations as well. You know there are different experiences for people of, of what Japan is. But Japan does maybe have our experiences in quite recent memory of energy saving practices among the public. So go back to 2011, when there were the, the there was the, the earthquake, the tsunami, and the nuclear accident in, in Fukushima. And well, took all the nuclear power stations offline overnight, the Japanese government took a blanket decision to shut everything down. And that left a big um, gap in, uh, in Japan's sort of energy mix. You know, there, there was a real lack of electricity. And so they rolled up something which was called Setsuden, which was basically about saving electricity. And in some, some places, the, the government did rolling blackouts. They actually had to do this earlier this year when an earthquake took a few of the big coal plants offline as well, temporarily. You know, they had rolling blackouts, so they shut down power to some districts on a kind of um, rolling basis for a few hours at a time. And people were encouraged to do things like turn lights off, you know, to businessmen were told to wear short sleeve shirts, and not wear ties rather than you using air conditioning, stuff like that. You know, and there was this big effort to save electricity. And the next one that's coming is going to be a big effort in Japan to save gas because of the, the Russia um, issue, Russia cutting off supplies. So... I would be a bit, I'm always, as I say, I'm always very careful about making assumptions about culture. But what I would say in Japan is there is, um, you know, as I say, this recent memory of using energy resources scarcely and being able to kind of take responsibility for that. The flip side of that was, you know, reducing demand for things like vending machines and heated toilet seats and music blading everywhere. You know, you do see in Japan a lot as well. So again, it's a great question. I would say maybe the difference between Japan and the UK is, as I say, there is this recent cultural memory of 
saving electricity, which can be appropriated and maybe used as a force for good, for, for more efficiency and for demand reduction. Another question coming into the chat here as well uh, from Louise. And Louise would like to know um, how the outcomes of the recent elections in Japan will influence Japan's climate change policies and actions? That's a great question. So just as a, a little bit of background, maybe for, for those of you that maybe aren't familiar, um, Japan had you know, elections at the weekend. Um, the, the ruling party, the, um, the, the Jiminto, the, um, the Liberal Democratic Party, they won. Um, the, the part, they, they were the governing party. They won. Um, the former prime minister, um, Abe, Shinzo Abe, was shot and killed a couple of days before. And whether that had an effect on the, the, the outcome or not, we, we don't know. But essentially what this means is that the ruling party got a bigger majority. And Japan's ruling party, their approach to climate change so far, it's, it's, it would be fair to say it hasn't been a priority issue. However, you know, the, as I say, there is increasing awareness of these things like energy security and where it comes from. And what the, the ruling party in Japan has been big on has been big on um, finding ways to reduce emissions from, from coal and gas power stations without shutting them down. So they want to do things like they want to mix in ammonia. They want to capture the emissions and store them in, in underground. They want to um, do more hydrogen. And like I said, um, Kishida, the Japanese prime minister, he just announced earlier today that to cope with energy shortages by the, earlier, by the, by the end of this year, he wants to restart, I think it's nine of the nuclear power stations that have been mothballed and idled since the Fukushima accident. So I don't think there's, but the elections, I don't think we're gonna see a radical shift in what Japan has done so far. I think geopolitical events are maybe going to make things a bit more urgent, but I, I don't think we're going to see much different to this current focus on maybe a slow move towards um, offshore wind, but also a lot of kind of progress on re trying to restart nuclear plants and trying to find ways to clean up the, the, the coal-fired power plants, which, by the way, I'm not 100% convinced by. But again, good question, a lot of aspects to it. Question here from Sano, and Sano says, how urgently do you think Japan needs to transition to renewable energy? And is there another country that Japan can look to as a baseline to help, help them plan for this huge undertaking? Brilliant question. Um, as for how urgently I think Japan needs to transition to renewables, I think the answer is very urgently. And that is for a lot of the reasons I've outlined already. <clears throat> Geopolitical security, reducing dependency on, um, on Russia for one, and um, also the fact that climate change is having very, very serious impacts on Japan. And there's long been, I think, there's been a kind of complacency. Oh, you know, we're good at disasters. We're good at natural hazards. We have lots of earthquakes and typhoons. We know how to plan for adapting to climate change. And I think what we've seen with the heat waves, with the torrential rain that's been washing away bridges in, in, in Saitama just in the last couple of days, is that Japan's infrastructure can't cope with the, the urgency and the intensity of climate change that we're seeing. So, you know, there's a real urgent need for Japan to, you know, step up its game on transitioning to renewable energy. And that needs to be happening much faster than it has been. Now, super question here. Is there a country Japan can look to as a baseline? And yes, there is. There's a country very nearby that can, that, you know, is not perfect when it comes to responding to climate change, but can tell Japan an awful lot about how to do offshore wind energy very fast and very well. And that is Taiwan. So Taiwan in a few years has gone from being, um, you know, a country that, you know, has, has been criticized again for needing a lot of coal and nuclear power to suddenly being Asia's leader in offshore wind. The Taiwanese government has moved really fast and really quickly to put lots of offshore wind in the sea. And I think Japan can learn a lot from talking to Taiwan. You know, another East Asian country, another democracy in East Asia that has energy security challenges, that has big nasty neighbors that are bully it in ways that are completely unacceptable. You know, Japan can learn from what Taiwan has done, you know, in attracting investment from overseas. 
getting these international wind players like the you know, the Danish players have done a lot in Taiwan, um, attracting them in, but doing that in a way that creates jobs and training for the communities and for the people in, in Taiwan. So Taiwan, I think, is a really good example Japan could look to, to learn a lot about how to get an offshore wind industry scaled up and going at speed very fast. And that, that's something I'd, I'd really like to see more of, um, especially, you know, there are lots of other good reasons as well to build alliances between Taiwan and Japan. Question again from Rachel in the chat. Um, what are your personal thoughts on nuclear power for meeting net zero targets across the globe? Is it a disguise for a different problem in the future? Well, great, great question. Um, yeah, nuclear power, I have to say, it's one of these things that I've been quite agnostic about for a few reasons. I think one of the, the biggest concerns I have when it comes to building new nuclear power stations is just the timescales involved and the costs involved. So we, we see this in England with, you know, um, Hinkley Point and, you know, Sizewell. All of these nuclear power stations, they seem to take a lot longer than the developers say they're going to take. And they seem to cost a lot more. And the problem is, given the urgency of climate change, you know, we need these things now. We don't need them in 15, 20 years. We need them now. We need them, we need them making electricity now. You know, that's maybe one of the kind of advantages that wind has and solar has. We seem to be able as a society to get these things up and running a lot quicker. Um, you know, and that, that's worth being in mind, it's just time frames. That's one of the big challenges I see with, with nuclear. The other side of that, though, and this is where, you know, Japan is maybe in a bit of a sticky situation. Pragmatically, you could say, if you have nuclear power stations already, you know, if they're there, if they work, you might as well use them. And that's, that's the argument that, uh, that Japan's been making. Funnily enough, if you look at some of the, some of the kind of, not all, but some of the quite radical climate action people, and you see a few of them on, on social media, are sort of saying the same thing as well, that if it's a choice between, you know, ramping up coal and gas power stations or using nuclear that's already there, then maybe, you know, using the nuclear that's already there because it emits less is the lesser of two evils. You then create problems, though, with waste. You know, well, where does that waste go? How do you deal with nuclear waste? Are there concerns about proliferating nuclear waste? It's not easy. Um, as I say, my, my thoughts on it are new nuclear. I think the, the, the time frames involved and the social acceptability issues involved mean it's very hard to reach the net zero targets. On a case-by-case -case basis, pragmatically, there might be cases for saying if we've got power stations there already, it makes sense to use them, but that, that must not become a means of delaying action on building renewables and reducing demand. You know, it, it has to be clearly embedded within, you know, a pathway to getting ourselves to 100% clean and renewable energy. So again, great question. Final question here, and um, final questions just come in. Um, talking about energy sources. Japan is a very seismically active country. And this person says, with that in mind, um, why don't we hear more about the potential for geothermal energy meeting Japan's energy needs? So this is a good question. So geothermal energy, this is this idea, you know, that you can take advantage of the, you know, the, the heat, the, 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 the warmth that comes from deep in the Earth's surface, and you can use that to create all kinds of power. Iceland is really good at this. You know, we've got a few... Um, demonstration projects in Scotland as well, um, near Glasgow, where people are wanting to use kind of old hot mine water as a, as a way of, of doing heating and things like that and power. So it would seem on the surface like a no-brainer in Japan that you might think, OK, it's a seismically reactive country. You've got all this heat under the surface. Why not use it? And in fact, you know, in the 60s, 70s, there were kind of localised cases where, you know, at a local level, um, governments, townships, even factories, you know, they were using the, the, the energy from, from the subsurface to power things. And it seems like a great idea. The problem is, though, that, again, there's 
cultural and local um, sensitivities to this. Why is that? Well, anybody who's ever been to Japan might know you have a lot of hot springs. You have a lot of onsen, you know, these wonderful warm hot spring baths, which are, you know, magnificent things. People love to go and bathe in the, you know, the, the, the water, the pure hot water that comes up from under the surface. For places that have a lot of these hot springs, these hot spring resorts, the sort of purity of the water, the quality of the water, and also the pressure of the water is really important. And so there's a lot of concern from local governments and also from innkeepers, hotel operators, tourist chains, about what it might mean if you suddenly um, you know, start drilling more holes in the surface. There's concerns about the pressure going down. And you know, there's some places where you have restrictions on the number of holes you can drill in case the pressure goes down, you don't get the hot water anymore. There's also a lot of worries about perception. There's a lot of worries about perception that if you start to drill holes and you start using this water for making power, that it comes to be seen as being dirty and, you know, and it affects people's perception of the kind of purity of the, uh, you know, of the water, which is a really important thing, as I say, not just for like people's sense of pride in their local environment, but also for the economics of trying to run spring resorts. So, Yes, geothermal is potential. It's something there is still awareness of in Japan and people are thinking about it. But you've got this really big challenge about the other things that the subsurface is used for, the other uses, the economic and social and cultural uses of the subsurface in the Japanese context. So um, I think that was the final question. Um, I think we're, we're just at time. Um, I just want to finish by saying thank you very much for listening. Um, just going to wrap up there. I think the question, what the questions have shown is that, you know, Japan's a country where you've got a lot of complex needs, a lot of complex energy and climate change challenges, where you need to do things now, where there aren't easy solutions, and where, you know, the, the problems, but also the, maybe the sources of strength, are, they're not just economic, and they're not just infrastructural, but they're also social and they're also cultural. You know, we talked about saving energy and, and recent cultural memory of that. We just talked there about hot springs and about, you know, the, the kind of cultural pride that comes in how the subsurface is used. I think, you know, I've talked as well about my, you know, my, my ice hockey team and the, uh, you know, how it's linked to a high emitting industry, you know, and that, that's the one thing I want you to take away today. And it's relevant in every context and especially Japan that, these social and cultural factors are not just barriers to transition, but if we use them rightly, they can also be a source of strength. And that's why planning now, thinking locally, thinking about local impacts and thinking about fairness for people, places, is so important. So with that, I will simply stop there. Um, thank you very much again for listening, tuning in. Um, my, you know, my, my social media details are on the slide. My email details are on the slide. If not, just Google me and you'll find me. And I'm very happy to talk further, take further questions um, over social media or email thereafter. But uh, thank you again. Thank you to the British Academy for funding this research. And um, I wish you a nice afternoon.